Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Welcome to our April public lecture and stargazing event from Caltech Astronomy. Uh, I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a researcher here, and I run the public education events, too. So we've got a really fun night planned with all kinds of activities and relatively clear weather, so hopefully we'll get some stargazing. Uh, so up at the door, we have flyers for our events. Uh, these occur, the public lectures and stargazing occur once every month. Uh, the schedule that we have is for the next, well, it's through the, the middle of June, but it doesn't just stop then. I'll just assemble the next schedule for July through December then. And our next event is a lecture May 10th. Mike Grudich is a graduate student here talking about how star, star formation occurs. It's called A Star is Born. Uh, so don't expect... Uh, Lady Gaga to show up or anything like that. <laughs> In addition, we have public events at a local bar called Astronomy on Tap. Those occur one Monday a month in Old Town Pasadena, and they're two short informal talks on astronomy while you enjoy a beer or whatever your beverage of choice is. So those are really fun and free. And they're open to all age ages, but children obviously can't drink alcohol. We also do other events. Uh, yeah, I'm going to show this because I think it's cool. Um, less formal events. Tomorrow we're going to be on, on the metro line holding up signs encouraging people to ask an astrophysicist. So it'll be really fun. See? Uh, but that's less formal uh, public edu education work. And, yeah. Oh, did everybody see the news about the the black hole in M887. Okay, that was super cool. Uh, we'll definitely talk about that tonight. So, uh, so the schedule for tonight is uh, I'll introduce our speaker, and then after, so she'll speak for r roughly 30 minutes and have like five or 10 minutes of questions, and then we'll kind of break, and you guys are encouraged. We'll have a, we'll have a table set up in here with four astronomers and planetary scientists here to answer various questions from the audience about whatever topic that you may have, astronomy, physics, space science, hopefully keep it to those topics. I'm not sure we can address other topics. And then outside we'll have a telescope set up on the adjacent athletic fields and you can follow the signs to get to the fields. Tonight it's a little bit hazy but we'll be looking primarily at the first quarter moon. We'll be looking at the Orion Nebula and probably the Beehive Cluster which is a young uh, star cluster that formed, well, several million years ago, but it's relatively young by astronomical standards. And then we'll have this infrared camera set up so you can like see what you look like in infrared radiation. And we'll also have a VR set up that takes you on a tour through, uh, through the TRAPPIST system, but Maya will talk about that. So our speaker for tonight is, uh, is a good friend of mine. I'm really pleased to introduce her. Dr. Maya Seidel did her her undergraduate at Jacobs University in Germany. She hails from Germany, and then she did her PhD at, uh, in the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa, owned by Spain and, and all of that. And she did a postdoc at the Carnegie Observatories just across the highway, um, the home of Edwin Hubble and uh, other notable astronomers, one, one of whom is here in the audience, um, Barry Medor. So we have, uh, she did a postdoc there, and now she is a staff scientist next door at the at the NASA IPAC Caltech Center for, for various ty types of astronomy, and she's going to talk to us about the Spitzer Space Telescope. So please welcome Dr. Maya Seidel. Yeah, thank you so much, Cameron, for this kind introduction, and uh, thank you for organizing this lecture series. It's, I think, a really great uh, public event. And for me, it is such an honor to talk about the NASA Spitzer Space Telescope because when I was about 15 years old, I attended my first astronomy youth camp. And one of the really amazing uh, images of the Spitzer Space Telescope was released, and I really um, couldn't believe how, how, like, what is out there in the universe. And um, if I would have told my 15-year-old self, I would be working for the Spitzer Science Center one day. The little Maya would have never believed me. <laughs> so for me, it's a real honor to uh, talk a little bit about how 
the Spitzer Space Telescope um, revolutionized astrophysics across all areas and revealed uh, some part of the invisible universe to us. However, I'm starting interestingly here with a visible image of the Cigar Galaxy. Um, but it took Spitzer to reveal actually the smoking hot cigar because if I show you the same object in the infrared, this is how it looks like. So these are um, particles, uh, so-called um, poly, called um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are blown into space. So if you don't know what this is, this is sort of what's on your barbecue or what's in the smoke. And uh, yeah, we see this really different object in the infrared compared to the uh, visible light. But um, to maybe go a little bit back to um, tell also everyone in the audience what actually is infrared. So we have a, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, which goes from really short gamma rays um, and then X-rays that you know probably from your doctor uh, up to radio waves that are really long. And what uh, Spitzer is looking at is the infrared here which is just the redder part of the spectrum. So our eyes only see this really tiny part of the visible light. So we see a dog like this, and if we look at it in the infrared, we would see something like that. It's kind of the heat radiation. So you see the mouth where it's panting, it's really bright. And that's what people also use for night vision. Um, as astronomers, we also use the term micrometer or microns, and the infrared goes sort of from one to a, about a thousand microns. And what does that mean? So here's a little picture to illustrate you. This is a, a human hair, and that's about 70 to 100 micron, micrometer in diameter. It's like a six micrometer nanotube. So it's like really operating in the hair length. So Spitzer is a space telescope. And why is that? Well, a lot of the, those radiations don't reach and the Earth. So we put telescopes in space uh, to get this, this uh, light from space. Also, and I want you to keep this in mind, the atmosphere itself radiates in the infrared. And another cool thing about the infrared is we, it lets us see through things. So here, that's me holding a black bag. And you don't see what is behind in the visible light. But if you had infrared eyes or an infrared camera, you discover that I'm holding a little human, my baby. <laughs> um, and in space, this is really useful. So there is a lot of dust in space. Um, and with the visible light, we can't look through it. But in the infrared, we can look straight through the dust. But what do we actually see when we look at dust clouds, such as this one, again, in the visible light? In the infrared, we see a protostar. We see things cooler, objects cooler than stars that give off infrared light. Those can be these kind of protostars, like a star that is just forming, where the material is kind of assembling in form of a pancake, or planets that are hot, or rather warm planets, and possibly asteroids or comets um, that, though, that emit still heat, like ourselves as well. Um, and another really good thing is um, that the infrared allows us to see the very early universe, and why is this? So these, this is a picture of galaxies, and all these red blobs are galaxies. Um, and some of you might have heard about the Doppler effect. So space is expanding. So if a galaxy like this is emitting light in all directions, but it is moving away from us, so the light, if it sort of emits in the green, it would be shifted to red. So here space is expanding, and the wavelengths become longer. So in order to see galaxies that emitted at some point ago in the optical light, but now the light is stretched, so it's much redder. And so in order to see those now, we have to go look in the infrared. And that is um, what Spitzer is doing. So Spitzer actually was um, planned a long time ago, around 1971, as the shuttle infrared telescope. So it was meant to fly in a shuttle above uh, the atmosphere. Then it moved to the Space Infrared Telescope Facility to be a, a telescope on its own. And then finally, when it actually already was in space, it was called Spitzer after Lyman Spitzer. 
It was launched on August 25th in 2003 and completed uh, NASA's Great Observatories program, where there's also the Hubble Space Telescope that you might know, or Chandra. Um, it was only planned for five years with actually a primary mission of only 2.5 years. Um, but it's still going, <laughs> which is really amazing. It's almost 16 years in space. Um, it exceeded all the expectations. So this is how the launch would have looked like. And guess what? I also brought you an infrared image of the launch and a little movie. <laughs> so um, I want you to look at the cloud layer, actually. So here it's lifting off. And you'll see when it's the uh, rocket is rising, the clouds will start reflecting the heat here. So the, you see how the atmosphere would glow and so in the infrared. So Spitzer has uh, an 85 centimeter mirror made out of solid beryllium. Um, and that is because we want to cool it down and we don't want the material to shrink. Um, it's just above 0, 0.5 to 12 Kelvin to be uh, so cold that it doesn't emit heat itself and kind of gets us annoyed by destroying the images. It has um, three different instruments. So if you remember this picture of the protostar, uh, the kind of blue um, uh, green colors are from IRAC which operates in the uh, like three to nine microns, so smaller than a hair. Um, and then the more redder color are from MIPS, which is operating in much longer wavelengths, so a few hair widths. Um, and it also had um, a spectrograph, which allows us to see the chemical composition of objects. So you see here the brightness against the wavelengths, and then you see sort of these features where here you have like a carbon dioxide absorption line, so that tells us that this object contains this component. Um, apart from uh, all these nice um, cameras, it really was a, a novelty in engineering. Um, so Spitzer was put onto an Earth trailing orbit around the sun. So every other telescope until then was orbiting the Earth. Um, but Spitzer is kind of has been put into space and is just drifting slowly away from the Earth. So um, that's really cool because the Earth is never in the way, and so it allows to do observations over a long time. But it also, um, at some point, so this is sort of until, this was until we expected it to be, until uh, like um, the, f the primary mission was completed, and then here is when the coolant ran out. But guess what? Since it's so far away from this heat source, the Earth, it uh, has this thing, um, or it can passively cool, and I'll show you how it does it. Um, so it kept operating, even though the cryogen, so the coolant, kind of ran out. And um, it's now here, but the problem is that it needs to point this part back to the Earth to communicate with us, but the solar panels need to go towards the sun. So at some point, the geometry doesn't work out anymore, where we would either run out of battery or cannot communicate anymore. Um, and the other reason is also um, rebuilding new instruments and budgets are limited. So, um, yeah, this is the final year of Spitzer and um, we're having a last year of sort of Spitzer final voyage. Um, now back to this passive cooling. So this is how the telescope looked like and you go like, Ah, oh, this is interesting. It has sort of like a shiny side and a black side. And I really like doing experiments, so I brought you this little infrared camera and a model of Spitzer. So here's my little Spitzer model. And I have some hot water. So I put the hot water inside the thing to make it warm. Sort of like turn it around a little bit, like this. And now you can think what would you see in the infrared light? Like, which side is emitting more heat? So here I have the infrared camera. And I hope you can see all the screen. Can you see it? Uh, like there. So what does glow bright is very much, it's very hot. So you see like this, right? So the black 
is emitting a lot more heat than the shiny side, right? Isn't this really interesting? I mean, <laughs> I think it's such clever in engineering. <laughs> um, right now, right? This. Um, to keep this telescope going. So basically, it points this part here always to the sun, so it's blocking the heat. And this side can re-radiate the heat to space, so it can keep going. And these kind of design changes, by putting it into the Earth's trailing orbit and doing, having this passive cooling, allowed it to go down from like a massive launch, which is extremely expensive, to a really sh uh, um, like smaller one. But apart from being revolutionary in engineering, it also was revolutionary in science. And this is what I'm really excited about as a, an extragalactic astronomer. So let me show you some of, some of the major discoveries. I can't recall everything um, in this short amount of time. So first of all, I want to show you our home. This is our Milky Way galaxy. So we are sitting in the plane of the galaxy, and we can see the band of the Milky Way. And for the first time, we really can see the center of the Milky Way because it is normally blocked by dust. But here we can see the stars towards the center of the Milky Way. And we can see how all these star-forming regions where um, there are like, uh, yeah, new, new stars are being born. And we can trace um, through a star called uh, Red Clump Giants, we can find out where these stars are because they have like a certain brightness so we can track where these stars are and build a map of our Milky Way. So this is an illustration by actually um, one of my current office mates, Robert Hurt, who is a scientist and a visualization um, scientist. And he could take this information from where we could see edge on in our galaxy where these stars would be and make a map of the Milky Way. So we are somewhere here in these outskirts of the Milky Way. And Spitzer was looking in the plane um, where these stars are distributed. And we find out, like, here's a bar, actually, in the Milky Way. Uh, not one with beer. But um, you can get this in the next astronomy on tap. Um, and then these uh, spiral arms that go around. Um, so this is our own galaxy, but there are many, many more galaxies. And as I said, Spitzer was really good in looking very deep into the universe. So already in 2005, they discovered, um, together with Hubble, uh, these big baby galaxies. So these are, this is the ultra-Hubble deep field that maybe some of you have seen. And they are galaxies, but we cannot see one here. But if we go towards the redder wavelengths here, it starts appearing. So they found um, that these galaxies are uh, living in the early part of the universe but are much more massive than expected. So these have like 50 billion suns in them. And then about a decade later, uh, Spitzer and Hubble together discovered the most distant galaxy. So again, we start looking in um, like, um, a shorter wavelengths, and suddenly in longer wavelengths, these objects start appearing. And this galaxy is existing when the universe is only 3% of today's age of the universe. So about 400 million years old. And the galaxy, the stars in the galaxy, thanks to Spitzer, we can know the age of the stars are about 40 billion years. Now, going back to the beginning of the universe, we also know the universe is expanding. But how fast? And that is a really important question. So um, Spitzer also contributed to that, and it was never built to do that, but people um, found, found a way to use Spitzer in that way to advance our knowledge in the expansion of the universe. So there are stars called cepheids that change sort of in brightness. So the brightness goes up and goes down, so it has this periodicity. And what's interesting is the brightness of the star itself is correlated in how, off, how this period is uh, with basically the period, how many peaks there are in a certain amount of time. Um, and this correlation exists in all wavelengths. So here we have sort of the brightness of the star and the length of the period. 
But this is if we were looking in the visible light. So there's still a large scatter. Um, and I'm kind of hiding these parts. It's just going through different wavelengths. But to focus on the longest wavelength, so this is in the infrared, the, this relation gets much, much tighter. So this allowed the team of uh, Friedman and collaborators to find the value of this expansion, the Hubble constant, by a much, much greater, um, in much greater detail, with much lower uncertainty. So they could, uh, um, and with former data, they had like a 10% uncertainty, and that went down to less than 3%. And to my knowledge, they're working on like the percent level by now, um, which is really interesting because there are several ways of measuring this, this expansion. So in blue, we see sort of the measurement with supernova and cepheids, and this error bar gets much smaller, and this is the way how um, Planck is measuring from the microwave background, and this is based on our cosmological model. So there's this discrepancy, and this will be a result that hopefully you remember this talk at some point, because th this might be the, the next big step that there's other physics in the universe. Uh, that we still don't know yet, to kind of reconcile this. Um, but bringing you back to our solar system. So probably you know what is this object. Saturn, Saturn exactly. But sadly, we cannot see it today, maybe in the later morning hours, if you stay really, really long. Um, but what Spitzer has found is another huge ring around Saturn. So this was an object super well studied already back in Galileo's days. And we know it because it has these rings around them. But apparently, it has another massive ring around it, which we cannot see in the optical, because we would be able to see it with our bare eyes, because this is the size of double the size of the moon. So if we already in like, this was discovered in like 2009, if we keep discovering these things in our vicinity, um, there's so much more to be discovered in the universe by just also looking in different wavelengths. Um, and it's not just our solar system that we're studying, but even other planets. So that is something that um, Spitzer was initially thought to look at sort of hot planets, um, but it's been looking at many, many, many planets. And one of the ways to detect planets is through, again, light curves. So we don't actually see the planet. It's too small for us to basically see it, but we measure the light of the star. So um, when the planet passes in front of it, so if the, the big planet, it makes a bigger dip in the light curve. So small planet makes a small dip. Bigger planet would make the brightness of the star drop by a larger amount. And I'm pretty sure many of you have heard about that. TRAPPIST system. TRAPPIST is actually the name of the star, uh, which was discovered in 2000. Um, it's an ultra-cool dwarf, um, and it's about the same size as Jupiter. Um, because it's cool, again, it's visible in the infrared really well, much better um, than uh, 4,000 times brighter in the infrared than in the optical. Um, so people were looking at it at first from the ground, and saw these funny light curves, not just one dip, but like sort of overlying dips, and was wondering, like, what is it? But again, we cannot, from the ground, look at the system for a long time because the Earth is rotating, right? But Spitzer is in space, not next er, around the Earth, but can stare at something for a long time. So they were staring at the system for 500 hours. And what they found is really amazing. So not just one or two planets, but seven planets orbiting in this system. And go further. And it's interestingly similar and different to our solar system. So first of all, of course, it's much, 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 much smaller because um, our sun would be this big, and the Trappist star is only a tiny star here. Um, it's a little bit more similar to Jupiter and its moons uh, going around there. Um, but the, since we have many planets in the system, we can observe also how in, they interact with each other. And so these interactions, 
we can learn about the density of the planet or the surface gravity and learn much more what they're actually made of and compare them. And we know this, this solar system, apart from our own, much, much better than any other one. So if we compare sort of to these are the Trappist planets, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and if we compare this, we see, yeah, they're sort of similar. There's nothing exactly like Earth, so this one is less dense, so here's the density. Um, so it probably has a bit more water or gas, but it's same illumination from the whole star, but this one is similar density. It's a little further out, so it might be like pretty icy, actually. Um, but there might be many solar systems that are, that are very similar, or planets around that, that ca can be similar. And um, there are more studies on planets and also material of deb debris disks. So this is, this is the material that sort of uh, circles around the star before the planets are actually forming. And we compare this to um, what we find in our solar system again. So how can we do that? Basically, uh, through comets. M maybe someone knows, has an idea uh, what this comet is. Seen in 95. Hey, Bob, exactly. Over Joshua Tree, of course. <laughs> um, and looking at the spectrum of this comet and at uh, debris disks and other um, solar systems uh, far away from our own, um, these spectra lo look strikingly similar and um, hint that they, they might form a similar solar system than we have. But of course, these are now discoveries that were made in the last 16 years, um, and there's so much more to tell. But uh, looking into the future, we are having the final year of Spitzer. So Spitzer is drifting away from the Earth, and it's the final voyage. But there are still lots of science going on. So um, it's operating until the 30th of January, 2020. And everyone can still submit proposals. The last uh, deadline will be in May. So if you have a brilliant idea, you can submit a proposal for Spitzer and, and let it observe for you. But what, we have, what is planned so far for observations is more looking for more planets around these ultra-cool dwarfs. Um, again, looking at the black hole, the center of our galaxy, and distant galaxy clusters, and hopefully the next neutron, neutron star merger from LIGO. Um, and then in the little bit more distant future, um, there's the James Webb Telescope launching, which is sort of a, uh, uh, yeah, people say sometimes um, it's the child of Hubble and Spitzer and combines all these good things from both of them together. And hopefully it will work once it's launched in space because we can't go repair it. This is actually a really cool thing. Spitzer was launched and everything worked. Uh, but it also had really no moving parts, and the one moving part, they never moved it just in case. It got stuck. <laughs> um, it was a shutter to calibrate, but wasn't fully necessary, and yeah, better not move it if you can't fix it. Um, yeah, so if you want to keep, uh, be, uh, yeah, keep being updated, what is the right term? You can look at uh, the Spitzer webpage, Final Voyage, where we um, release really spectacular image every month. There's, there will be a blog also um, where people tell a little bit. There's personal stories because there's people that have wor been working on this for 30 years. Clearly not me, but um, yeah. Um, so and there are little interactive things. So we have a, a NASA selfies app which you can download onto your phone, <laughs> and um, then you can get a funny backdrop, such as the Spitzer Space Telescope. <laughs> and who is this guy? Well, that's Yuri Gagarin, like worldwide normally today is also Yuri's night, and now he had it last week in LA. But um, currently this app only features Spitzer images, so there's a number of Spitzer images, also the Cigar Galaxy, if you remember. This is combined now with um, Hubble data, Sombrero Galaxy, uh, you can share it, and you can learn also a lot more uh, about the object. And then uh, also there are these exoplanet excursions. There will be also an, another VR experience on actually the Spitzer uh, telescope. 
And you can always see those as well in YouTube and 360, but I brought this one in case the weather isn't too great. We'll set it up outside, and so you can um, walk through the TRAPPIST system. Um, but if the weather hopefully is good, you'll be looking at this thing. I think Cameron said it before, and I hoped for it. <laughs> I didn't actually know. So um, what is it? If you remember what Cameron was saying at the beginning. Oh, Orion. Orion, yeah, and, and there's the nebula, right? So um, this is the constellation. So now how would this look like if we put on our infrared eyes or look at it with the infrared camera? Bigger. Well, if we go outside, it actually would look like this because the atmosphere, remember? The <laughs> it doesn't come through. We have to go in space first. So if we went into space, we see something like that. So the constellation is still there. So here we actually have to see the star. But then see this whole dust cloud around this nebula here, right? It's illuminated, illuminated by the stars. Um, and it's really, really strikingly different from what we can see with our eyes. So with this, I really want to thank you so much for your attention. And I brought you uh, one extra picture. So again, what could this object be in light of the news uh, this week? It's M87, the black hole galaxy. <laughs> but what we see here is a Spitzer image, right? So we see a macro scale. So we actually see these interesting features here. These are like sort of jets coming out. And if we zoom in um, and sort of see, this is what the famous Hubble picture was of this galaxy. And this is what they saw with the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, and we will hopefully release a little bit back better picture. This picture had never been released as such, actually, from Spitzer. It's from the archive put together. This, um, um, next week, so keep on the lookouts. And yeah, thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed the talk and enjoy the celebration. So what what is this? So there are different telescopes in space. What does the James Webb do? Okay, so the James Webb is still on the ground. Uh, we are um, it's still being developed, and um, it will launch. What will it do? What will it do? Yeah. So it will also look in the infrared, but it's much more powerful than the Spitzer telescope. So it will be able to look so through so. Remember I showed this, um, the map from our galaxy. I can go back. Uh, wait, actually, um, one example, right? So here, actually, Spitzer can only look sort of until here because um, there's an issue of crowding. There are lots of stars um, that uh, we ca it cannot resolve. But with the James Webb, you will be able to resolve up until the uh, the yeah the other side of our galaxy so really. Yeah. So basically, um, it yeah depending on the telescope, it can take infrared pictures or it, Hubble takes pictures also in the optical. Um, Chandra will take them in in X-rays. Yeah, or they can take spectra as well. Um, yeah? Uh, what is the angular resolution? What is the angular resolution? Yeah. I cannot tell you on the top of my head, to be honest. <laughs> um, yeah, it depends on the wavelength. Yeah, so it operates in different wavelengths. So it, um, the, you have better resolution with IRAC the IRAC camera, which operates in like a lower wavelength, and then you have MIPS 
which doesn't operate anymore, but yeah, less resolution. So uh, all the pictures that you see in the infrared compared with Hubble pictures always have less resolution. Yes? Mm -hmm. So um, that's a really, really good question because um, in the infrared we can measure, so I'm a galaxy person, right? Um, so I, I'm looking at galaxies and if I want to determine the mass of a galaxy, I want to know how many stars there are and how many heavy stars there are. And usually, or the stars that are older or that that are more in the redder part um, are the ones that are making up the, the mass of the galaxy. So young stars shine really, really bright. So if you were looking um, in the visible light, you sort of get a biased view um, because you would say, oh, there's so much light in, those, in the young stars, but actually they don't make up a lot of the mass. So for us, um, looking at, at galaxies, we usually take Spitzer data to have a much better idea of how heavy the galaxy is. Yeah? Um, so, when you measure on Spitzer, is it like iron gold? Where is it going? So, yeah, where is it going? <laughs> I wish. So, it is on this, it's on the Earth trailing orbit, so it was sent out at some point, and it's, drifting away from the Earth. Um, so basically, it will continue on this orbit going around the Sun. So we are moving in this direction, and Spitzer is also moving in this direction, but drifting away in that direction. So it still keeps going around the Sun. But the problem is, so maybe i take my little Spitzer can. It's a little bit full of water. but. Um, so the problem is that Spitzer wants to communicate with the Earth. So it um, needs to always point kind of the backside to us, like if, you know, this is the Earth. Um, but it needs to have its solar arrays towards the sun to charge its batteries. So when it goes further this way at some point, um, it can communicate, but it doesn't receive any more power from the sun. So at some point, you need to recharge and communicate, and then at some point the German two gets so bad that you know it's too far too far back. And also, if it's if it would point then again back to the back to Earth or to the uh, yeah back to Earth, we wouldn't have any more battery. But yeah, the other sad reasons is there's there are limits in the budget, so we have to we will turn it off. And the end of, or it will be turned off at the end of January. Mm -hmm. uh, someone, yeah. yeah. Um, probably not. Um, so it's a yeah, it's a good question. What are we doing with all the you know sort of rubbish in space? Um, but um, yeah, once once it's turned off, it's basically turned off. Um, there were more questions over here. Yeah, you. Um, this is related to the geometry of the sun. But what about pointing at the target? Like, is there no? Uh, so yeah. So basically, it um, it charges. And this is also, um, actually, this is a good model as well. So when it when it's observing. It will take data in whatever position, uh, as long as it has battery. Then at some point, to, it needs to downlink to send the data. So it needs to um, point back towards the Earth. And some, so, so it, will op, it will observe, and then it will downlink data. And um, during this um, downlink, sometimes it needs to turn a bit to recharge. So it, you have always like, yeah, it was never meant to be this far, but it's really cool that it got this far. Wait, Does it, do I explain myself? Oh, here. 
Um, yeah, well, it, it would not look at the sun, right? But it can look everywhere else, right? So it, um, it has a, so it will charge the battery, and then it can look. But it then, to downlink the data, it needs to point towards the Earth to communicate. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, we could we could keep it alive, but again, the, there's these there are these budgetary constraints. If you want to keep Spitzer alive, <laughs> please write to your congressman. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> it's around the sun. So, let uh, Now, so the idea originally was that the James Webb telescope was already launched um, last year, uh, or even before then. But normally, it would have been launched in September 2018, if I remember correctly. So then there would have been a much smoother transition between, okay, we are saying goodbye to Spitzer, but there's James Webb. <laughs> um, now we have to wait a little longer because we need to wait for the next good launch window for the James Webb tel uh, Space Telescope. Um, but then we have a much, hopefully if everything goes right, um, it will um, be a much more powerful telescope uh, but Spitzer really paved the way for James Webb and for many of the missions that are sort of being proposed right now. The ne yet next one, like Origins or Louvre telescopes. Yeah. Yes. We would be really happy. <laughs> yeah. One more question, Cameron says. Um, yeah. Why can't I use another? A uh, beryllium. Um, Technically, you could use something else, but beryllium has this nice property that it doesn't shrink when it's getting really, really cold. Um, so that is really what, what was needed um, to cool down the, the mirror uh, just above like 5 to 12 Kelvin. Um, yeah, just above absolute zero. This was when there was still the cryogen in the mission. And uh, when the cryogen ran out, uh, it went up a little bit like by I think 30 Kelvin in total because it is th like in space being passively cooled um, and it still allows uh, two channels to be operated in one of the instruments, IRAC. Um, yeah, which is really cool. And, and there was something I think as well. Um, so I'm learning a lot of these little anecdotes from the people that have been working on this for a much longer time than me. Um, when they sort of, they had to stop operating and then um, restart things when the cryogen ran out. Um, and they first uh, uploaded the commands and then temperatures kept rising or something. Um, and the thing was that Spitzer didn't commune, or it was like an older software uh, which didn't take like 64 or 32 bits or something. I don't know, like, there was something that, um, yeah, the communication had to be uh, arranged accordingly, and then it worked, and, yeah, something that really people have not expected. It's really awesome. Yeah. Okay, let's thank our speaker, Dr. Maya Seidel. <laughs> thank you guys for sticking around. We're going to get started with the panel Q&A session. So our panelists uh, are members of both the astronomy department here as well as the, the planetary science department right across the street. So Nancy Thomas is a fifth year PhD student in the planetary sciences department. And we've listed a few different topics that each of us is comfortable answering questions. You can obviously answer qu or ask questions or even answer 
questions. Um, ask questions from topics that aren't listed here, like nobody listed black holes or the Event Horizon Telescope, but we should be able to field some of those questions. We don't have anyone who was actually on the team on this panel, but we can, we can try and field them. Uh, so Nancy Thomas is comfortable asking or answering questions about Mars, solar system, and ex exoplanets. Uh, Gao Tinyanant is a graduate student, PhD student, third year? Fourth year, sorry. Fourth year PhD student in, in astronomy uh, here in this department, and he's comfortable answering questions about supernovae, infrared astronomy, and brown dwarfs. Brown dwarfs are like massive planets that aren't, they're almost stars, but not quite stars. They're kind of in between stars and planets. And then Gina Panapulu, yes, I got the pronunciation correct, uh, is a postdoc in the astronomy department here, uh, and she's comfortable answering questions about interstellar space, star formation, and how we measure stuff and like distance to stuff. And I'm Cameron Hummels, I'm a postdoc in this department in astronomy, and I listed galaxies, computer simulations, not like video games, but like computer simulations for, for physical systems. I mean, I like video games too, like we can talk about video games. Um, and cosmology, like how the universe forms and evolves, and well, maybe not forms, but the evolution of the universe as a whole. So, uh, so we open it to you guys. Do you guys have qu Yes, you have a question, sir. Right, yeah. So the question, the question is, when, when did we really figure out that there were other galaxies other than just us, other than the Milky Way? And yeah, you basically got it right. Uh, the Edwin Hubble, operating at the Mount Wilson Telescope, was the first person to really confirm that there were other galaxies beyond our own galaxy. We'd seen these objects like the Andromeda Galaxy, but at that time we thought it might be a nebula, it might just be like a small cloud of gas that was inside our own Milky Way uh, because we weren't really good at determining distance, which maybe Gina wants to talk about. Uh, and, and then finally, finally we figured out that it was really, really far away and it consisted of stars, and so it was another galaxy. How many galaxies are there in the observable universe? Uh, we've observed something on the order of 100 billion, but we predict that there are more on the order of a few times that. We just don't have the sensitivity with our telescopes yet to be able to see every galaxy within the observable universe, because there's a lot that are below our sensitivity. But as we increase uh, with the technology and telescopes and being able to see fainter and fainter structures, then potentially we could see uh, see more galaxies, so a lot. There are a lot of galaxies in the observable universe. Do you want to add to this? No? Sir. Oh. Junior, sir, then senior, sir. Okay. The, the question was, how does interferometry work? Uh, the combination of different signals from many different sources and, yeah, I'll let you do it because I don't want to do it. Okay, so, um, so interferometry is a, uh, basically a technique that you can use to get more uh, spatial resolution out of your telescope. So if you remember during the talk, um, uh, Maya mentioned that um, you know Spitzer has a size of the uh, of the mirror of 0.8 meter, so that doesn't really give you a really good uh, resolution. So to to make like an image, direct image of the black hole, what you can do is that if you have two telescopes um, at some distance away from each other, uh, you can try to combine the signal between the two telescopes to gain a resolution that is limited by the distance between two telescopes and not the size of the telescope. Now the problem, uh, well that sounds simple, but the problem is that, so typically your telescope looks like this, right? It has a 
kind of circular-ish mirror. And so if you want this distance to be, in, ca in the case of the Event Horizon Telescope, this is the, the size of the Earth, so about 6,000 kilometers. Now you can make a single dish that is 6,000 kilometers long. So what, what you do is that you plop, up, you plop down some telescopes, few places in this uh, 6,000 kilometer wide dish. And then you try to combine the signal between these uh, telescopes. The problem is that you are not covering the whole the whole dish. So that's uh, that's why there's a lot of talk in the news about um, uh, the postdoc who who helped developing the algorithm to to combine signals from these different telescopes to make an image happen. Uh, but this is the the fundamental reason why why the problem is not straightforward and why it took us so long to. And also took them so long to to create the images uh, that they showed. Yeah. So. So the. Um, at, so something that that. Gao kind of implied but didn't say explicitly. The resolution, the, f the, the fidelity of your image uh, is tied to the size of your aperture, the size of your mirror. And so that's why you want a larger mirror because you get finer and finer resolution. And so by using the entire Earth, even though it's not fully sampled, you're, 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 you're increasing the size of your aperture so you get very, very high resolution. Just wanted to make, that, make sure that was clear. But yes, essentially what's happening is your, let's say your distant source is here. That's my, I'm not a good illustrator. That's my star or black hole or whatever. And the electromagnetic waves are coming from that. And they not only have intensity, but they also have phase. So they're all aligned in phase, but then you know, some of them will strike this slightly before they strike here or slightly before they strike here. And so really what has to be done is to realign the phases of those different paths that the light is taking to the different telescopes and, and, and combine that in a fairly complicated way. Yes, it, it has to have extremely, uh, extremely good time information about when the signal arrived at each of those telescopes. So they use these very, very high precision atomic clocks that lose like a second in 10 to the 10 years or something like that. They're extremely high precision so that you know exactly uh, when it arrived here relative to when it arrives here or there. And so they weren't able to just send the, you know, combine the signals via the internet or something like that because that introduces all kinds of other problems. So they recorded it on a hard drive here and they recorded it on a hard drive here and then shipped those hard drives to the same place where they also have the time information when it arrived on that hard drive for all of those, and then they can combine it. So you may have seen this image of, of uh, Dr. Katie Bauman lording over like this pile of various different hard drives, which represents like a petabyte or a few petabytes of data, which a petabyte is a thousand terabytes, and a, th a terabyte is a thousand gigabytes. So it's an enormous amount of data. Um, and then looking, you know, having to come up with new algorithms in order to combine that information all into a single or a set of images representing the, the, the signal that came from the black hole. Does that make sense? I don't want to get too de I just don't want to get too detailed into the nature of interferometry because it's a big pain in the butt and you have to take a lot of courses to like get really proficient at it. So um, I should go with you since I called on you before. So, sir. Uh, so the question is a follow-up on a previous question about the number of galaxies that we see in the observable universe. How has that number changed with time? Uh, certainly 100 years ago, the answer was zero because we didn't really recognize that those kind of wispy things in the distance were actually distant galaxies beyond our own Milky Way. Um, and it's increased. I think, I actually don't know 20 years ago what the estimates were, uh, but, but the advent of systematic surveys like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is a telescope that operates in, um, 
in New Mexico and scans the sky repeatedly over the course of nights. It's only scanning the northern hemisphere because that's all it can see uh, is the northern sky. But that gives you, re and it, it goes deep and deep and deep into very, very faint objects. It gives you a really good estimate and you can extrapolate from the numbers that we see relevant to, or relative to the limitations of that telescope and how deep it's looking and then extrapolate on that. So I, I, think, I think astronomers in the past, we, we're pretty good at recognizing our limitations and the biases intrinsic to our techniques. And so I don't think the numbers have changed that dramatically in the last few years. We just, we're better at, we're more confident at, at saying what we're saying in terms of hundreds of billions of, of galaxies. But I don't know. You could probably look in Wikipedia and it'd tell you that I'm wrong. So I don't know. Uh, sir, in the back. Oh, uh, so the question is, how long were the telescopes operating of the Event Horizon Telescope to be able to produce the image that we saw in the news, yeah. in the press release in the last few days? And follow-up question, can you increase the aperture of your telescope by taking images of the black hole as the Earth orbits around the sun to increase the size of the aperture. Yes, you should be able to do that. It's going to be a much, much more difficult problem because you're shifting not just relative to each other on a fixed, relatively fixed sphere, the surface of the Earth, but you're changing depending on the orbit, and the orbit is not like such a stable. It, that's a mess. I think that would be very difficult. Yeah, well, and a precision of uh, like trying to figure out our absolute position in space over time. I think that would be extremely hard. But those, the, the image, the single image or the four images that you also may have seen, uh, that took place about two years ago. They were observing over the course of like six nights, April 5th to the 11th, something like that. And they got really lucky in that the weather was good in eight different locations or six days there. Six different locations and eight different telescopes, and they got really lucky that the weather was decent over many of those nights to be able to produce those images. But it was just over the course of a few nights, as opposed to years. Uh, yes, please. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, another follow-up. Oh, but she wanted to add something too. Okay. Um, also, the difficulty in using, like, the Earth and its orbit. Uh, comes from the time scale. So in order to make this image, uh, we had to, they had to assume that the black hole is not changing. And typically, the M87 black hole changes like in 50-day time scales. But if you were to wait six months, it would change, and we need to develop the tools to be able to image it if it's changing. That's great. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, contrary to what you would believe, it's not empty space. It's it's very, very good vacuum compared to what we can make on Earth. Vacuum means, like, uh, absence of stuff. But still, uh, space is filled with hydrogen, mostly, which is, like, the element that pervades the universe. Um, a little bit of helium, and then other trace elements. The hydrogen that is between the stars forms clouds, and they sort of look like the clouds in the atmosphere, and you saw them in the pretty images that Maya showed. Um, these clouds are what form stars, um, and also, apart from these hydrogen clouds, there are energetic particles that have, like, the energy of a tennis ball that can hit you um, <laughs> very, very fast. Um, what else is there in inner solar space? There's dust. Oh. Could be, yes, yes. <laughs> Actually, yeah, the Oumuamua, how do you pronounce that guy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, so you should be talking about that guy. <laughs> but we have had a visitor from interstellar space. So. Uh, yeah, there's definitely some uh, 
there's been talk of rogue planets, and there are some sporadic um, observations of those as well, as well as uh, what we were referencing earlier. There's an object called Amuamua that made headlines uh, in the last couple of years. That was this weird sort of cigar-shaped uh, asteroid that just uh, we could tell by its orbit when we started observing it in the solar system wasn't actually gravitationally bound to the sun. So it was just a visitor that was coming in and then has sort of faded out of our view. Any other questions? Yeah? In the, uh, in the back, you. Go ahead. How is a nebula formed? How is a nebula formed? Of Star formation? <laughs> sure. Sure. We'll do it. Okay. So this comes in multiple steps. First, you have to make the stuff, so make the hydrogen, and that was made in the early universe. And then you sort of have a, a universe that has hydrogen inside its galaxies. And then this hydrogen is heated up by all the energy from the stars, so the radiation from the stars and exploding stars that are supernovae. All these things heat up the gas, the hydrogen gas, and it's very tenuous, very diffuse. In order to make clouds out of this, you have to wait for it to cool down. So it emits radiation, cools down, and condenses into clouds. And these are the interstellar clouds that I was referring to. Does that answer your question? A what? I couldn't hear the word. Oh, a Y ray. Um, probably gamma ray? Yeah, gamma rays. Gamma rays are the most energetic photons that exist. Um, they, I forget what, how, yeah, what else can we say about gamma rays? Um, they're emitted by the most energetic things out there, like active galaxies and, I don't know, supernovae? A little bit. A little bit. Not too much. Gamma ray bursts. Many, many exciting stuff emit gamma rays. Um, not sure what else to say about them. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Um, here and then in the back. Yeah, so uh, there are actually pretty much uh, one major telescope per wavelength bin, right? Uh, there are gamma ray telescopes. Um, the current one is called Fermi, for example, and there are also X-ray telescopes uh, like XMM Newton and uh, Chandra. And right now, there's uh, there's no big ultraviolet telescope, but that's uh, being developed and being built. Um, yeah, H H Hubble can can do like. Um, kind of like a near near UV, but not but not too far out. And then, uh, uh, of course, Hubble is the main uh, optical telescope. And then we have Spitzer, and then in a few years, uh, James Webb as an infrared telescope. Um, and then for for longer wavelength, it becomes more difficult to uh, to make a spacecraft off of. And this again goes back to the resolution problem, because resolution depends not just on the, uh, the size of the telescope, but it's actually, um, it's, it's actually the wavelength of the light divided by the size of the telescope. So as you go out and in far infrared and radio, it, uh, it becomes impossible to, to make a decent telescope that you can put in a rocket and send up to the space. Uh, and that's also why um, I think longest wavelength um, you can do from space reasonably is a, a, about, uh, about 100 microns. Yeah, but yeah, there, there, there are telescopes for all these wavelengths, and they all look at different things. Right, and from the back. The question is, how do spiral galaxies get their rotation and then the features like spiral arms and such, right? That is the question. Uh, so if you take any random distribution of material in the universe, there's 
bound to be some amount of asymmetry in the motion of that stuff, right? It's, all, it's not all just sitting there fixed in place or uh, if you pick some arbitrary point as your center, there's bound to be a little bit of rotation, even just a hair, right? Um, but as gravity works, and gravity is an attractive force, so it, it attracts everything around it, so it pulls it into a, t a smaller and smaller structure. Just like a figure skater uh, who is maybe spinning just a little bit when their arms are way out here, but then they, when they pull them forward, it spins them up. It'll enhance that very, very slight rotation that that random amount of material had, and it'll start to spin increasingly uh, fast because angular momentum has to be conserved. No, uh, it doesn't, some will and some won't. Okay, so, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, the question was, does that mean spherical or elliptical galaxies will eventually turn into spiral galaxies as they collapse? And the, the answer is, it's complicated. So, uh, galaxy evolution still isn't fully understood, or else I'd be out of a job. Uh, there are many of us still working on the problems of, of galaxy evolution. But uh, conservation of angular momentum plays a major role in, in understanding how galaxies evolve over long stages. And one of, those, one of the ways we better understand this is uh, running computer simulations so you can speed up the the time scale over which you, you see the evolution of these systems. Because it takes a really, really long time relative to how long humans live or even a civilization might live. And so if you have a bunch of stuff and the center of mass of that stuff, everything, yeah, maybe there's only a little bit of rotation when it's, when it's all there. But as it shrinks down, now it's here, and that rotation is substantial. So you have this disk structure or whatnot. Elliptical galaxies we see formed from a variety of different ways. But one of those ways is if you take two disks, uh, disk galaxies, where one disk galaxy is like rotating that way, and then maybe another disk galaxy is rotating that way, and they run into each other, their rotation kind of wreaks havoc with each other and it kind of cancels out in some capacity and then you end up with kind of like a spheroidal blob of stuff because all that gas that was going that way and that gas that was going that way all mixes together and it just ends up kind of crazy like but this is already quite condensed and a lot and in ellipticals usually in disk galaxies you have substantially more gas in them which is the fuel for stars uh, and gas when gas runs into gas like if you take a gas cloud here and a gas cloud here and slam them together, they, it's called a collisional fluid because they'll collide and they'll kind of transfer some of their energy and momenta to each other. But if you have a bunch of, but if these are uh, a disk of stars, not gas, and another disk of stars, those stars are very, very small relative to the volume that they, that they take up. They'll pass right through each other. It's considered a collision-less fluid because they can the amount of volume that the individual stars take up is very small. So they can just pass right through each other without any collisions. And so what you end up having in an elliptical galaxy like this is lots of stars and not very much gas. So it's not, it's not, uh, and many of these stars are not on any kind of rotation, rotational orbits. They're usually on like radial orbits. So they're traveling out in and out from the center of the, the galaxy. So they're not gonna, what I want to say is cool off. They're not going to turn into a, a ro more rotational structure. They're just going to keep doing their thing because they're not colliding with anything else that's going to influence their, their, their trajectories, their orbits. Sorry, that was a really long answer. Uh, then it hopefully made some sense. They, they do sometimes. We don't fully understand how they form, but that is one way in which they can form. But you can also have spirals forming from mergers of spirals if there's enough gas left over that it can retain some of the original rotation. Or, you know, you might have a spiral galaxy that's doing its thing, and then another spiral galaxy comes in, and it brings in enough gas, and it doesn't have enough star formation that it, the final structure is another spiral galaxy that's more along the rotational axis of the galaxy that struck it. 
It's really specific to the actual dynamics of the collision. And, and we're, we're still trying to figure it out. But it's, it's, it's a non-trivial thing to figure out. Do you guys want to add anything with that? Okay. Sir? Yeah, that's that's what I was trying to. That's part of what I was trying to say, especially here at the end. Is um, if you've got one galaxy that has some rotation, so there's some angular momentum in the orbits of the gas and the stars that are in the one galaxy, but this is bringing in an and a lot more angular momentum because it has a longer, uh, it's larger moment of inertia because of a longer baseline, and so it can transfer a lot more spin to the final product. So it just it really depends on. The nature of the galaxies, their trajectories, and then how much they're made up of gas and how much they're made up of stars. The Andromeda? Uh, so the question is what happens when the Andromeda galaxy uh, merges with the Milky Way, which will happen in roughly like six or seven billion years. So don't worry, we're not going to die. Well, we'll be dead is more what it is. Um, so what will happen is in that particular case, uh, what we predict to happen is, so both of those systems are disk galaxies, like what we were talking about um, in the first kind of illustration. So let's say this is the Milky Way, and this is Andromeda. And eventually they will merge, because we're traveling at each other, and this is us. That's the sun. Here's the Earth. We're about like halfway, not to scale. We're about halfway out in the in the in the in the, the sun, in the disk of the Milky Way, the Sun and the Earth are, and when they merge, the gas that's present. Remember, I said gas is a collisional fluid, so the gas that's present in both of those galaxies will slam together, and it'll cause an enhanced density that'll cause a bunch of new stars to form. Our our like when this happens, like I said. Uh, stars themselves take up very, very little volume, so there will be very little... We don't predict any collisions of stars from their galaxy colliding with our galaxy, or planets colliding with, between the two systems as they merge, because most of it's just empty space. But the gas will slam into each other, cause new star formation, and, uh, and, and then you'll just be left with mostly stars, and it'll form an elliptical system. So it'll form an elliptical galaxy. We call them elliptical galaxies because they look like an ellipse on the sky, but it's really like a hard-boiled egg shape kind of structure. And it'll be mostly, mostly older stars. It'll be mostly stars and not as much gas. There won't be as much star formation. But there will be a burst of star formation that takes place when those, when those two systems collide because the gas slams into each other. And that will be bad. That will be bad for us because bursts of star formation mean there are lots of young stars and young stars turn into supernovae. Young massive stars turn into supernovae. So there will be a bunch of supernovae going off all around us which will like burn off our atmosphere and cause all kinds of problems. But again, we'll be dead because it's 7 billion years in the future so I'm not so worried about it. But if you have really long generation of children, maybe you should worry. But... Uh, gentleman in the back. Theoretically, what would a star collision look like and would it form a new star? You want to talk about blue stragglers? Who wants to talk about it? So we do think that star collisions do occur, just not with galaxies slamming into each other. We think they occur in very, very dense stellar environments like globular clusters. Globular clusters, they might look at M3 tonight. You can see it in the sky. It's a little challenging with our telescopes. Uh, globular clusters, I'm just good at drawing circles because that's a lot of what we see in the sky. Uh, globular clusters, you may have seen one, the most famous of which and the most identifiable which in the sky is called M3, Messier number three. Um, is M3 the Hercules cluster? M13 is, oh, oh okay. Uh, so yeah, there's a bunch of different globular clusters. They look like their name because they look like a glob. Uh, they're essentially like a circular looking thing and it, it's very, very bright in the center and then it gets progressively fainter, but it's just made up of lots and lots of stars. 
So this is, this is what a globular cluster looks like. And in the centers of globular clusters, it's really, 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 really dense. There's lots and lots of stars there. And they're orbiting each other really, really closely. And so the collisions, you tend to find uh, evidence of collisions like that, evidence of stars that collide in the center. And we call them blue stragglers because, because reasons. Because uh, when we make certain plots called color magnitude diagrams, where this is the color of a star and this is its brightness, uh, also called magnitude, um, you see characteristic shapes that tell us something about the, uh, the path that a, that a star takes in its lifetime. It starts out relatively blue and low uh, brightness, and as it ages, uh, it goes a little bit up in brightness, and then eventually it goes, and it through changes in its... I'm not the star formation, per, stellar evolution person, person uh, supposed to be talking, but it'll enter its red giant phase and it'll start turning redder and then getting much brighter. And blue stragglers sit at a location in that diagram that they couldn't get to through normal evolutionary processes for a single star. So it's more characteristic of two stars that are like this that merged together and just stayed the same color but got brighter, which is weird. But... Have we ever seen a merging star? I don't think so. Yeah. Have we? Yeah. Oh, well, Gar will tell us. Actually, this is kind of related to the talk because uh, um, I'm working on uh, one project called Spirits, which is uh, Spitzer, uh, let's see if I can remember this, Spitzer Infrared in Intensive Transient Survey. And what, what we did was we used Spitzer to look at nearby galaxies, about um, 200 of them. But uh, unlike a normal survey, when you go to a galaxy, look at them once, we keep going back to them and take new photos every uh, six months or so. And then sometimes, uh, occasionally, you will find a new point source popping up. Now, this was a, a totally new idea that uh, my advisor, Mansi Kasua, who gave a talk um, a while back, um, had. And uh, so we, we conducted this survey starting from 2014, and we found a bunch of sources now, the cool thing about these sources is that, um, as you remember, Spitzer is uh, operating in the infrared. When you try to look at the same galaxy using a normal optical telescope from the ground, it turns out we don't see anything. So most of these uh, transient events are still pretty elusive, and we don't really know what happened. But there's one example uh, from 2014. There has been more since. But there's one from 2014 that when we point a big telescope on the Earth at this we found signatures of uh, molecular hydrogen emission. So this is pretty rare because it turns out it's really hard to convince molecular hydrogen to emit light at all. Um, and what, uh, what we thought is that this is what happened when you have, as, as Cameron said, you have two stars in a very dense um, uh, environment, which, uh, which is also covered in, in this uh, gas and cloud, uh, gas and dust cloud. So when you have a merger, um, the 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 eventual object, which is a merged star, send out this strong but not but not supernova strong, but uh, some shock wave propagating into this uh, molecular cloud, and that shock is what excited uh, molecular hydrogen. So that's one example that that we had from 2014. Yeah. Yeah, there, I think there are a few more too, but then again, as, as you said, it's super rare, so it's not something that we see like every month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I can try it. So um, let's see. So one problem is that usually you don't have a lot of uh, computer, like computing resources on board. Uh, so a lot of the like observation versus downlink decision is made on Earth, like at least for our current missions. For for example, Spitzer will downlink everything, like the full image. And then you have cases, like if you heard of uh, Kepler Space Telescope, which is this very wide field telescope looking at like 100,000 of stars uh, to detect planets going in front of it. So uh, uh, 
Maya show a little bit of um, trans, uh, transit work with Spitzer, but a lot of the transit observation is done by this telescope called Kepler. In that case, this is impossible to download the whole image because you have, uh, I, I don't remember how many uh, enormous detectors, so you can't download every pixel. So in that case, uh, the decision was made beforehand to download these specific uh, 100,000 stars. Yeah. So it, it depends, but mostly it's, uh, it's basically images. Yeah, so you get a file with, uh, you know, this huge table, say your detector has uh, one million pixels, and you have a table of one million entries, uh, and each of them will tell you how, um, how many counts you get, basically. So that would uh, be proportional to how bright your source is. And then you ha have to do a lot of calibration to turn that into like a physical flux. No, no. Uh, yeah, I guess it depends, yeah. It depends on instruments, yeah. But for, at least for ground-based telescope, we try not to compress anything because uh, for ground-based telescope, there's no data constraint. You, know, you can write it on, on whatever you have and bring it home. Nope. <laughs> Uh, so the, the, the communication protocol that was developed to talk to the different space telescopes and the different probes since, you know, Voyager 40 years ago, um, has, or 50 years ago, a long time ago, uh, is through the Deep Space Network. Um, so it's essentially there are a bunch of radio telescopes on the Earth that point up in the sky, and then there's a series of satellites that are orbiting around the Earth, and so the distant space telescope, if it's around the Earth or if it's around Mars or something like that, will communicate with that satellite network, and then that satellite network will com communicate with the, the downlink stations that are the radio telescopes. Um, and I do know one of our former postdocs here now works at JPL on that, because when it was originally developed, because we're scientists, we didn't worry about security. Um, and so it was basically like Telnet. It was totally open. And if you had the equipment that could point up at one of these satellites, you could be like, oh, I, I'm going to tell it to do this. Or you could gain access to whatever because people weren't like, oh, we need to encrypt this or, or do something like that. That's now changing. So people can't hack the satellites and tell them to turn it whatever they want. But um, 40 years ago, there wasn't concern about people taking over distant space telescopes and such. Um, I don't know the details of. I don't know. The, I don't know the details. I'd be just speculating. Do you guys know? No. No planetary questions. We've got a planetary person here. She knows her stuff. Uh, the gentleman in the back first. You. Yes. <laughs> That's true. That's where um, there's a, I think, I'm, oh yeah, so um, you're asking a question, if I'm understanding you right, about radiation potentially coming from the ground on Mars as measured by Curiosity. Yeah. Uh, so the instrument aboard Curiosity I think you're referring to is an instrument named DAN. Um, which is a dynamic albedo of neutrons instrument, uh, is what DAN stands for. And so DAN is actually, there's also an instrument aboard named SAM. So if we have any DANs or SAMs in the audience, you have a <laughs> <laughs> nice, you have an instrument named after you on the Curiosity rover. Uh, so the, the DAN instrument, though, specifically, the one I think you're asking about, is on board the rover and measures the um, neutron flux coming from underneath at about like a about a meter scale underneath the rover, uh, which is coming from uh, certain elements contained within the rocks. 
So I think the element or the uh, material you guys probably often hear a lot of hype about when you hear about Mars is water. And so the DAN instrument is there primarily to measure the water content of the bedrock. Um, so as like different high energy particles come in and um, bounce off of the uh, uh, molecules within the rock, um, neutrons are emitted at specific um, frequencies which the DAN instrument can then measure and tell us a little bit more about how much water is in the crust of Mars, which is actually exactly what I study as well using a different instrument named ChemCam, which is the laser spectrometer on Curiosity. Uh, let's Yeah, and so I don't work on the DAN instrument, so this is getting into the weeds for me, so I can't give you any more specific details on that one. If anyone else works on neutron spectroscopy, okay, sorry. <laughs> but uh, let's go. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. That's because we haven't heard anything since then. Yes. We don't think that Mars has plate tectonics like Earth. We think it's just a um, single solitary crust. But we do want to know more about, we don't know really how big the crust and the mantle and the core of Mars is. Uh, so. That's why Insight's partially there, is to help measure those things. We don't think the earthquakes on Mars are going to come from some of the same mechanisms we have earthquakes from on Earth. Instead, we think um, impacts that are actually hitting the Martian surface might cause small Mar Mars quakes um, that Insight can measure. I was just at a conference like two or three weeks ago called the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference where a bunch of InSight scientists like presented on their most recent results and so far they've just measured noise and they've very well calibrated their detector and are very ready and excited to detect the first Mars quake. So stay tuned. That's a good question. That's <laughs> subject of research. A lot of people are, oh yeah, the, uh, sorry, in case you didn't hear the question, um, it was why is Earth the only planet that we know of that has plate tectonics? And that's still an active area of research. Um, we don't know too much about the surface of Venus because uh, Venus is obscured by such a big atmosphere um, of CO2, so we don't have that many surface measurements. Landers and rovers haven't been there really yet, um, at least from NASA. So uh, we don't know too much about that surface. We think Mercury is probably too small and the other um, rocky bodies in the solar system like Mars and others are too small, but we're still trying to figure out um, why some planets have plate tectonics like, and others don't. Uh, probably not, but uh, there are, we think um, we don't really see signs of that. The, orig the crust on Mars, why we study Mars, at least why I study Mars, and I think it's so cool, is it's very, very old. Uh, we can actually tell by crater dating and other techniques that all the surface on Mars that we can see is billions of years old, like almost as old as the age of the solar system and back to when the planets formed. So that means all the crust that we see on Mars is pretty much uh, primary, so it um, formed when the solar system formed. And plate tectonics, if um, you know, like sort of recycles the crust and turns over material, which is why so much of Earth's surface is very, very young and doesn't really give us access to study the processes that were present at the very beginning of the solar system, which is why I think it's really cool to study Mars because we get to study very, very old rocks. Maybe some non-solar system questions too. Um, how about Red Hat? <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, 
Ooh, I have a friend who um, was at, uh, a grad student at the University of Virginia and is now a postdoc um, and is working on that question. There's people trying to detect magnetic fields from exoplanets and they haven't been able to detect them yet. Um, so they're using some very, uh, I forget what telescope they're using. Do you, either of you know more about these observations? But I, I should remember my friend's research. But <laughs> uh, uh, that's a work in progress. Nobody's detected one yet. Uh, the next rover, Mars 2020, which, as you can guess, is going... Oh, the question, by the way, is was do any of the current Mars um, missions have technology that could detect, like, microbiology? Uh, and so the next Mars rover is named Mars 2020 currently, and, as you can guess, is going to land on Mars in 2020 and survey uh, the surface with a different toolkit than Curiosity, but will look pretty similar to Curiosity. And that instrument is supposed to um, have more instruments that are a little bit more sensitive to um, biosignatures, which are what we in the sort of planetary science community called like signs of life. And Mars 2020 is also really exciting because it's going to be stage one of Mars sample return. So Mars 2020 will go around and collect a lot of Mars rocks in little sample tubes for a future mission to collect and bring back to Earth. And so then we'll have uh, the powers of all the laboratories here on Earth, which are much better equipped than a rover um, to potentially detect signs of life. Not a planetary science question. <laughs> yeah, so the question is what determines the speed of light in the universe? Uh, hmm. it, it seems intuitive to me that something is holding it back from being faster. What is hmm. it about the universe that's holding light from being faster than it uh, Right, so. Let's see. So during the like the turn of the century, about around the 1900s, uh, the the thought at the time is that there's, you know, light is the light was thought to be a wave, and as like all waves we we observe on Earth, you need to have some medium for the light to propagate through. Like for example, sound wave propagate through air, and you have a water wave through water. So people used used to think that there must be this uh, medium that exists everywhere. Uh, in the universe that let light uh, propagate through. And uh, that material is called ether, it w or was named ether. The problem is that uh, there, there have been a, a, a number of observations. Um, for example, uh, if we know that Earth is moving around, uh, around the sun, and so at some point, Earth should be like moving away from, say, like a star. And at some point, it should be moving towards the star. And if there is this material that light is propagating through, when Earth is moving away from the star, we should detect that the speed of light is, um, let's see, relative to us, is slower. And when we are going toward the, the point source, the speed of light should be faster, right? It turns out that that was never detected. The speed of light is always constant. Doesn't matter. Uh, uh, which direction the Earth is rotating. So, yes. Well, it's not just that it isn't, why isn't it faster? I mean, that comes from the perspective of it should be instantaneous. It should be traveling at an infinite speed, which is just our human intuition for it. But why shouldn't it be slower? Why is it the speed at which it is? But that, the same could be said, it, it's a constant of our universe, 
um, why are protons the mass that they are? We would have a very different universe if protons had a different charge or a different mass uh, or electrons, something like that. So there are a number of different physical constants that physicists can measure about our universe that are intrinsic to our universe. And we don't necessarily understand why those constants are the value that they are, why Planck's constant is the value that it is, why the speed of light is the value that it is. But it makes our universe behave in a very particular way. And if you tweak these values a little bit, you end up with a very, very different universe. So there's a, there's a lot of... I wouldn't, there's a lot of research into this. I wouldn't call it necessarily scientific research. It's more like philosophical research, speculating what kind of universes would be uh, when you tweak those values. But a lot of it goes into the anthropic principle, which is humans can only exist, or life as we know it can only exist in universes where these values are the values that they are here. So we couldn't very well be in a universe where the speed of light might be 10 times what it is, or 10 times slower or 10 times faster. It just wouldn't have the same characteristics that enabled life and humans to develop the way that they did. But that's a very, it's not really a, you know, it's a biasing of your, of your, your hypotheses to go about doing that. So it's, it's, it's not really in the realm of science at that point. It's more in the realm of speculation and philosophy because we can't like test, like put out a hypothesis that we can test because we can't create another universe with all these different, different things. No, there doesn't appear to be any kind of mech exactly. It, there doesn't appear to be a mechanism that causes the speed of light to be what it is. It just appears to be an intrinsic value of the nature of our universe. I know that's not a very like great response, but unfortunately, that's all we've got. Sorry, that's hard. Do you guys want to add to that? Okay. Uh, who, no, do you want to? No, do you want to add to that response? Okay, Nancy. Okay. The gentleman in the back. Reasonable, yeah. The question is, uh, based on the results that were announced by the Event Horizon Telescope last week, does the image that we were able to take of the black hole, uh, is it consistent with what we thought black holes should look like, or does it totally change our, our understanding of how black holes and relativity work? Do you want to, I mean, we can talk about this. Uh, no, it's what we predicted. I mean, we thought it would look something like that. We didn't know the exact angle of the accretion disk or, uh, or whatnot, but it's not like totally off the wall. People weren't like, oh my God, it's, we've all been wrong. Einstein was wrong. It's consistent with the laws of physics that we understood and the theory of relativity that we understood previously. So um, I don't know. That's like the broad brush response. But So I, I didn't know this, but... Uh, we we were having like a a Parmen event a few years uh, for a few days ago, and and uh, a fellow grad student told me that one one thing that we learned actually was that there was this like whole class of uh, gravitation um, theories that are uh, being developed as like an alternative to GR that has been all thrown out <laughs> uh, because because of this observation. And uh, most of them, I think, predict that the event horizon will will look more. Uh, we have more features to it than what what observed, and so I think that was interesting, right? and I didn't know. I I I think I think there there yeah there are always some. Yeah. <laughs> Up front. Right. Okay. So, yeah. the The question is, um, do we know where Big Bang happened, and if not, why not? 
Anyone want to try? <laughs> I can try. <laughs> you should add. So um, short answer is Big Bang happened everywhere <laughs> because when it happened, it created space and time, if you can imagine that. Um, yeah. No, th I mean... Oh. oh, yeah. Okay, so just to try and paraphrase what Gina said. Um, the Big Bang happened everywhere because it was the beginning of all space and time, which is absolutely correct. No, that's, yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, as far as we know it, we don't know, so there's the observable universe, which is just the universe that we know about because it's been around long enough that the light and information from the farthest edge of that has had time to travel to us. But for all we know, the universe could be infinite beyond that, infinite in size. And something that's the crazy stuff about infinities is that one of the crazy things, because there's lots of crazy things about infinities, is that there's no center then. If it goes on infinitely that way and infinitely that way, there's no like central location that it all started from. Um, and what's also crazy about infinities is that that means that at some point in its past, the universe was, you know, just as the Big Bang was starting, was like basically infinitely dense, but it was infinitely uh, in extent as well. And as it expanded, it started to grow. And so it wasn't growing within anything else because it's already going to infinity, it's just expanding, which is, again, crazy to think about, right? Because infinity is a really hard concept for our mind to conceive because we don't normally deal with things of infinite size. But uh, right now, we can't rule out that the universe isn't effectively infinite in, in scale and size, but that's, a, that's an example of how to think about like, oh, there can't be a center because it's infinite, or it could be infinite. It doesn't have to be in one point. It has to be. It has to be infinitely dense. It has to be very, very dense, and then it starts to, uh, it starts to expand. But that doesn't have to be in a single location. Um, and furthermore, then you enter into things like, like what Gina pointed out. It's not just space that is that's expanding. It's all of space time. And space time is a slightly different biz, uh, deal than 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 just space because it, it's all, you know, space and time. And so. The idea of, of, of locations expanding into larger volumes just kind of breaks down. And I realize it's not just difficult for you to conceive of, it's also difficult for all of us to conceive of, even though, you know, we've studied this for a long time. But, like, these are really, really counterintuitive ideas. Right. Well, there weren't there weren't stars for a long time after the Big Bang, but yes. So everything. So as an example, yeah, it's just a jumble. So uh, relatively shortly after the Big Bang, so right after the Big Bang, uh, you have photons, light rays, flying everywhere. But uh, there's also protons and electrons and uh, subatomic particles flying everywhere. And at that point, they're all coupled. You know, a photon will run into uh, a, a, maybe a hydrogen atom. That'll split into a proton and an electron. And then maybe that'll couple again and, and spit out a photon. So it's all, it's all coupled. But as it expands, it cools off. And eventually, you get to the point where those photons can travel without running into the protons and electrons anymore. It's called the surface of flash scattering. It happened about 400,000 years after the, after the Big Bang. And then all the photons have just been free streaming since then, just like flying everywhere. And that's what we see when we point our telescopes up and look at something called the cosmic microwave background, um, which was discovered, you know, 1977. Nobel Prize, Penzias and Wilson. It's great. Uh, but uh, at this point, those photons, those light rays, have been redshifted because the universe has expanded. They've been stretched, and they operate in the microwave part of the spectrum, the, the, the part of the radiation spectrum that your microwave heats water up with. Um, a couple millimeters in wavelength, I think. And, uh, and those photons are just flying everywhere. So when we point our telescopes in the, up in the sky, we see these photons coming from every direction in the universe because that light is traveling from every direction in the universe, from every direction to every other direction, much like you were talking about when you suggested that stars 
with the expansion of the universe. We're flying everywhere. There aren't stars doing that. There are photons. There are light rays doing that, left over from just after the Big Bang. Does that kind of make sense? It doesn't totally make sense to me, but I'm, yeah. Okay. What's the next big exciting piece of astronomy or astrophysics that's going on now that you want to know so that you can sound really important when you're like, yeah, well, I heard, you know, two years down the road. Uh, good question. I, I, probably everybody here has a different opinion. Um, more LIGO stuff. Uh, the gravitational wave discovery when black holes or neutron stars or compact objects merge. Uh, they release radiation that's not electromagnetic radiation like what we can see with our telescopes or with our eyes. It releases gravitational wave radiation. Um, so the Nobel Prize was given to this two years ago for, for the LIGO consortium that has these weird telescopes that are on the surface of the Earth. So they're continuing to operate at higher and higher precision. And now they're, it, thus far we've detected what, like 10 black hole, black hole mergers but they just turned on again with increased sensitivity and they've already detected like one in, yeah, a couple in the first like three days or something. So th this is just gonna be increasing with uh, frequency that we detect more and more of these things and that we detect weirder and weirder. You know, it's like people always say like opening up a new window on the universe, you can, you can see things that you didn't necessarily expect to see. You can see the things that you might expect to see, but you can, you'll also potentially see new things that are just like, oh, we didn't even know about that because we, we didn't have the eyes to be able to see it or we didn't have the ears to be able to see, hear it. Um, so I, I anticipate lots of things on that front, but there's, lot, I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that's going on. Do you guys want to? Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, as usual, water on Mars. That's all the headline that you read. Um, so Mars 2020 will make a splash, of course. Um, so look out for that one. <laughs> and then uh, the next big planetary science mission that I think will yield a lot of really cool discoveries, or at least knock on wood, I hope it will, is the Europa Clipper is going to be an orbiter that will go around Europa and take some wonderful, oh, which is uh, one of the moons of Jupiter. Uh, and it's one you've probably seen pictures of. It's um, icy. The surface is this icy wonderland. Um, and scientists think they've detected an ocean underneath all that ice. So um, this is going to be a really hot topic in planetary science as Europa Clipper starts to measure and probe and take lots of pretty pictures of that moon of Jupiter and start to understand a little bit more about its comp composition and hopefully pave the way for a future uh, mission called the Europa Lander, which will do what it says, land on Europa and hopefully um, maybe begin to detect life there, which could be cool. Um, let's see. Yeah, I have a very long wish list <laughs> of things that I wish would happen. Uh, one of them is uh, a galactic supernova. So there, which is not too close to us. So close enough that we can see, but not too close to kill us. Uh, so the problem is that um, with the galaxy the size of uh, Milky Way, we expect one supernova every 100 years. The problem is that the Milky Way is overdue by several hundred years because there haven't been any uh, supernova that happened in the Milky Way for, for several hundred years. Uh, I think the last one was like 1600s or something. And it was spectacular, like you can see it during the day, right, because these things are so bright. Problem is that we didn't have giant telescopes in the 1600s. So we don't actually know much about supernova, um, uh, like the, the nitty gritty details that you can get by being able to resolve it with telescopes. Um, so I think next big thing, at least in, in transient science, is if a supernova blows up somewhere close to us, not too close, but close enough for us to observe directly, that would be really cool. And uh, in addition to uh, electromagnetic observations, now if, if the supernova is close enough, we can actually detect gravitational wave coming from it. We can also detect uh, neutrinos coming from it. So if 
there were to be another uh, galactic supernova close to us in next, hopefully before I die, <laughs> uh, we, will, we will be able to make like such amazing observations that you can't get anywhere else. Um, final point. So I've got my eyes on the cosmology and trying to figure out the signature of inflation. Um, and this is like the signature that gravitational waves left on the cosmic microwave background that Cameron was talking about. And we, at some point, people thought they saw it, didn't see it after all. But we're getting to that point, I think, in the next few years. And that would be cool. Okay, we have reached 10 o'clock, and it's pretty late. <laughs> so uh, I think we're going we're gonna to retire there. But I uh, hope you guys had a good evening, enjoyed uh, Maya's talk and then our panel, and hopefully got an opportunity to look through the telescopes outside. And, yeah, we'll be here in a month, and there's astronomy on tap a week from Monday. So maybe we'll see you there. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs>